the Santa Claus we'll know and love, the fluffy jolly man in red who brings gifts to good girls and boys on Christmas Eve. But the collection of photographs dated as far back to 90th century revealed that Santa Claus was not always the portly, jolly, red cheek figured known today. A stick thin pious man with a walking stick. The fascinating images show what Father Christmas looked like before he became the coolly bearded man marketed to modern day consumers. A strange image of Santa Claus with his creepy eyes looking at the camera from 1897. Santa Claus with his Mickey Mouse look-alike friends from 1929. A little boy looks like he is frozen with fear as Santa Claus whose face is covered completely by his white hair. The spooky large Santa Claus in the mask totally dead behind the eyes as he stands with children. According to some myths, children who have misbehaved are instead visited by a far more frightening creature, Krampus. Santa Claus and his Krampus friends who were used to frighten naughty children in 1900. A bedraggled version of Santa Claus crawls into the chimney in this image from the early 1900s. This unusual image has Santa in a fury coat and black hat as he rummages through his gifts. This Santa, photographed in the late 19th century, shows him bringing toys as children sleep, but he appears to be covered in paint. Santa looks far less polished than his modern look in this picture, with a pile of disorganized toys. Another ghostly Santa stands over a sleeping girl and her mother in this American image titled A Dream of Christmas from 1897. Some images of Santa were accompanied by Krampus who beats badly behaved children and drag them to hell. Santa in 1895 looks friendlier than some of the others, but his clothes do not match up with our modern Santa Claus. An image of a Krampus from 1902 banished those who had misbehaved. The man in red began appearing in American culture in the 18th century when in December 1773, a newspaper in New York reported a story about the Dutch settlers celebrating St. Nicholas Day. Back in the day before these Dutch settlers arrived, historians say that on every December 25, People loves to party and often get drunk and stumble around the cities. A bunch of blue blood New Yorkers decided all this fun must stop. When the Dutch came to New York, they brought center class, 
This helped them had a good idea. They wanted to domesticate Christmas, bring it indoors, and focus it on children. Santa Claus was anglicized to Santa Claus, and in 1804, John Penthard gave woodcuts of Saint Nicholas as gifts. Gift giving, a custom that was passed down from Saint Nicholas' generosity in helping others, has been a part of the Christmas tradition. The American stores began advertise Christmas shopping in 1820, and by 1840, newspapers across America were carrying Christmas advertisements featuring Santa Claus. In 1841, many children traveled to Philadelphia to see a life-size Santa model. The lore of Santa and Christmas giving were becoming popular in the United States. The Salvation Army in the early 1890s started sending unemployed men in Santa suits to solicit donations for the needy families. Salvation Army Santas have been ringing their bells on street corners and in front of stores since the start of this tradition. The character really took hold with the Christmas poem, an account of a visit of St. Nicholas, was written by Clement Clark Moore. This poem later became known as Twas the Night Before Christmas. The publication of the poem led to the popular version of Santa as a jolly old soul with a portly figure and the ability to climb down into chimneys to leave presents under the trees for good boys and girls. After leaving presents at one house, he would dash away to another house on his sleigh being drawn by eight flying reindeer. Santa's images went through many transitions during the years prior to late 19th century to early 20th century. Santa was illustrated as a tall gant man or a spooky looking elf. Santa's clothing varied from a bishop's robe. During the Civil War, Thomas Nass, a cardinal, drew Santa for the Harper's Weekly as a small elf-like figure who supported the Union. In later years, Nass transitioned Santa's coat from a tan coat to a red coat, a color that is currently used for Santa's clothing. In 1930s, the Coca-Cola company decided to make an advertisement that could answer their problem during the chilly winter months. How do you convince customers that soda is not just a summer beverage but should be enjoyed year-round? They wanted to create a heartwarming and universally appealing campaign that would resonate with the masses. And who better to be the face of that campaign than the jolly old man himself? Santa Claus. Coca-Cola hired Haddon Sandbloom, a talented illustrator, to create a series of Christmas advertisements featuring a lovable plump Santa Claus who lived in a very cold area in the North Pool. Little did they know this decision would forever change the way we picture Santa. Sandbloom's inspiration for his Santa Claus was none other than his good friend, Lo Fuentes, a retired salesman with a hearty laugh and a twinkle in his eye. He captured the essence of Fuentes in his illustrations, creating a Santa who was both friendly and relatable. The red and the huge black belt, which happily matched Coca-Cola's signature colors. The result? was a warm, approachable figures that evoked the spirit of the holiday season in a way that had never been done before. The legend of Santa Claus can be traced back hundreds of years to a person named Nicholas, who was revered for his untold generosity and selflessness. Saint Nicholas and Santa Claus are historically the same man, but unlike the jolly figure who flies on a sleigh from the North Pool, 
the saint came originally from the balmy Mediterranean coast. It is believed that he was born in the year of 270 in the town of Myra, now called Demri of modern Turkey. He was raised a devout Catholic by his wealthy parents, but their sudden death due to an epidemic left young Nicholas with their vast inheritance. Instead of using this money to make a life for himself, he devoted his entire inheritance to help the poor and studied under his uncle to become a priest. At the time Christianity was illegal under the Roman Empire, he continued study to be a priest and spent time in prison for his beliefs. However, after Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity, Nicholas was elected bishop of Myra. During his lifetime, he became famous for defending his people against imperial taxes and other forms of oppression. A story of a loving father with three young daughters without a dowry to offer their suitors, he's worried about dying and leaving them penniless in a world dominated by men. Nicholas heard of a devout man who has once been wealthy but had lost all of his money due to a wicked storm that sank his merchant ships. The man's eldest daughter was being courted and falling in love with the son of another merchant. It was a fine match and offered her daughter the security of a home and family of her own. The young man had proposed to his daughter and had an appointment to meet the father to sign the marriage contract. But in those days, young women had to have money in order to get married. This money was a dowry and it was used to help the new family get started. Even among peasants, many expected a woman's family to provide them with something of value such as a cow or a sheep to accompany the woman they married. Options for single women without money in those days were very limited and amounted mostly to choosing between begging, prostitution, or being sold into slavery. But the dowry was like the marriage contract of that time, required the bride's father to provide before the marriage could take place. However, the father no longer had anything, can't even buy enough food for them. Without the dowry, there would be no marriage. Hearing of the girl's plight, Nicholas decided to help them, but being too modest to help the family in public. He went to the house under the cover of the night and threw a purse filled with gold coins through the window. On that night before bed, the oldest daughter washed her stockings and put them in front of the fire to dry. In the morning, the daughter saw a lamp in her stocking. Reaching in, she found a small heavy bag. It had gold inside, enough to provide food for the family and money for her laundry. The father's joy did not last long. His second daughter announced that she was falling in love with a man who had been courting her and the young man had proposed marriage. Again, the father lay in bed worrying about being unable to pay the laundry and having his daughter's future ruined. The next morning, another bag with gold was found. Just as before, the second daughter was soon happily married. When the third daughter announced that she accepted the marriage proposal of her view, one night, the father planned to stay awake to find out who was helping his daughters. Cold, stiff, and tired, the father was just about to fall asleep when he heard footsteps. Quickly, he jumped up and investigated. He saw a figure of a man sneaking toward his open window and tossed a bag of gold down to his chimney. The father recognized the face of the young and saintly Nicholas. He started to speak and thank him, but the saint already left.
One story tells how during a terrible famine, a malicious butcher lured three little children into his house, where he killed them, placing the remains in a barrel to cure, planning to sell them off as ham. Saint Nicholas visiting the region to care for the hungry, so threw the butcher's lies and resurrected the pickled children by making the sign of the cross. Although this story seems bizarre and horrifying to modern audiences, it was tremendously popular throughout the late Middle Ages and widely beloved by ordinary folk. After his death, people believed that Nicholas continued to work miracles. His burial place, below the floor of his church, became a popular destination for the pilgrims who begged Nicholas to relay their petitions to God. Visitors to the coastal town of Mara spread Nicholas' fame along sea roads across the Mediterranean. From there, word passed to the Latin West and upriver to Russia. Soon, pilgrims from all over Christendom were traveling to Myra to seek the gifts of protection and healing from the saint. In the 11th century, when the Seljuk Turks invaded Anatolia, Christians feared that the Muslims who now govern Demri would disregard the saint's tomb. So one crew of pious Italian Christians decided to take action. Their real mission was to steal Saint Nicholas' corpse. In 1087, a group of merchants from Bari traveled to Myra to steal the corpse of Nicholas from his sarcophagus in the church without authorization and brought them to their hometown where they are now enshrined in the Basilica di San Nicola. Particularly in Europe and around the world, Saint Nicholas, Saint Nicholas in Dutch, or Nicholas in German, is remembered annually on December 6, the day he died. On the eve of December 5, children leave letters out for the saint alongside shoes left out by the fireplace, on the window sill, or outside their bedrooms. These shoes are filled with fruits, sweets, or other small gifts and treats. In Italy, children aren't the only ones receiving the gifts, unmarried women get a look in too. Single women may also head to Mass to participate in Rito del Nubelli, a ritual that is supposed to help change their luck in finding a spouse. In 2004, Professor Caroline Wilkinson used facial reconstruction technology to visualize what Saint Nicholas would have looked like based on his skeletal remains recorded by the first modern researcher in 1957, Luigi Martino. Her findings were updated in 2014 and reveals Saint Nicholas is described as a Greek man living in Asia Minor, about 60 years old. 5 feet 4 inches tall with a slender to average build, who had a heavy jaw, olive skin, and had a broken nose. While he may not look like the jolly old Saint Nick that the public commonly seen in popular culture, there do exist some features that are recognizable in popular representations and one could almost sense a twinkle in his eyes. 